you very much for coming. Uh, today I want to talk to you about the book that I hope will pass on some of the techniques that I've found really useful at the start of my career onto the next generation of uh, young automotive engineers. Uh, this is based on about a decade of research that I've done as part of my work in Formula One into different disciplines in science and mathematics and how we can apply those to get the most out of uh, engineering, uh, but also the things we do every day. And uh, the book's called Ace Thinking. So, uh, what's the point of Formula One? Is a question that my close family asks me quite a lot. Uh, they, you know, they'll say things like, you, you're well educated, uh, you spent a lot of time at university, uh, you work long hours, your team spends millions of pounds flying hardware all around the world, uh, all for something that's essentially pointless. Uh, but the, suffice to say, that's not how I see my job. Uh, no shaving a tenth of a second off our lap time in Barcelona isn't going to cure any diseases or, or bring peace to war to one countries. But maybe the techniques that we used to do it can. So in Formula One, we use the power of the intense competition to blaze a trail in technology and process uh, that I hope can demonstrate what's really possible to other engineering industries. Uh, technology in Formula One has been used to improve the efficiency of medical production lines, uh, the process of dealing with critically ill patients at Great Ormond Street Hospital, uh, and also just to improve the efficiency of supermarket fridges. For me, this is like an ongoing space race where if we can deliver on the most important aspects of uh, our jobs in engineering and to develop the car, then we will succeed and hopefully other industries and maybe the rest of the world can benefit from it. So this is something that's driven me uh, working for the last 13 years in this industry. For me, there's huge value in uh, making the way we work as efficient as possible. The more efficient we can make our processes for adding performance to the car, then the more we can expect to add, and the higher up the championship we can expect to finish. This often involves us taking a step back from answering a question, and instead wondering what the question we should be asking is. And this is where we, we keep looking to academia for help. So the research projects that, that get done in universities like this. We used to find that when we were working, we'd always come back to the same key ideas from, from science and mathematics, and these things used to permeate through everything we worked on. Uh, not only just in engineering, but you know the creative process, uh, people management, uh, and by sort of harnessing the, the power of these, uh, these common elements of everything we were doing, uh, we were able to achieve great success in uh, some of the projects that we were working on. And then uh, when COVID hit, we had a, a, a bit of time to think about these similarities. You know, is there a, a natural conclusion to, uh, to this line of thinking? And can we use that to build a model for uh, how we should uh, perform you know, anything that we choose to do? And, uh, and use that model to tell us how to behave and to make things better. Uh, and if we can make it universal, then you know, maybe we can share it with other people and uh, show them how to apply themselves in, in a similar way uh, to get the most out of whatever it is that they're doing as well. So this for me would be satisfying the point of Formula One. So uh, I'd like to put this to the test. Uh, I'd like all of you, or you know, some of you, to shout out some of the things that you've been working on today. Uh, they could be as part of your studies, part of future work, uh, part you know something you've done socially, uh, maybe part of former student projects. Uh, I can get started. Uh, this morning I drove into work. I'm going to have some other volunteers. I took a planetary gearbox apart today. Fantastic <laughs> example. <laughs> A lot of the braking system on that. Very good. Can't let's do two more. Anybody? I can pick people. 
I finished a preliminary design report for next year's Formula Student Car Hubs. Oh, very good. Well done. One more. Finished cat assignment. Fantastic. So, uh, I think we can classify all of these different jobs under one heading uh, in the book I've called tasks. What I hope we can demonstrate is that all the tasks that we take part in have several elements in common. In common. Uh, first thing being, they're all involving human beings. It's quite difficult to take a planetary gearbox apart without somebody uh, there to do it. Uh, you could be working on your own, you could be part of a team, uh, you know, maybe you're, you're a whole country working towards one particular aim. Uh, when you're doing it, you're, you're working towards a goal. So uh, taking apart, reassembling the planetary gearbox is going to be uh, presumably with a, uh, an aim to improve it, to make it better, to fix it, uh, understand how it works, something like that. And you'll be performing this task in a particular setting. So uh, when you're doing uh, completing the design report, you're probably sat at your computer with connections to the internet, uh, CAD software, something like that. You And the rules of this uh, setting are going to constrain what's possible. So, you know, for example, your, your computer's only at a particular speed, uh, you've, you're, uh, as is the same with your internet connection. Uh, the, the rules of the setting govern what's possible. So uh, I've called these uh, agent control and environment, which conveniently for me uh, spells out case. Uh, so here's a simple model where I've arranged these elements relative to each other. And uh, we've added in a couple of processes called learning and optimization as well. Uh, the importance of those uh, will become clear towards the end of the presentation. Uh, hopefully this is all very simple. There's no rocket science intended here. But what I hope we can show is that we can use these as hangers to place some of the key ideas from, from science and maths uh, that can tell us how we're going to need to behave to get things done. So, let's get started with agents. We're going to find uh, all our agents have got uh, two elements that we need to think about. Uh, first of all, what, what I call the utility function uh, and some resource. So, roughly speaking, the utility function is uh, what you want to do and the resource is what you have in order to do it. So, if it's something you're performing on your own, then you can look at your own wants, desires and your own resources, what you've got in the bank balance. Uh, you know what what you've got in in your labs in order to uh, to perform a particular task. If I use the example of my job, the agents of, of building a Formula One car uh, at McLaren are our shareholders. Uh, we it's our job to kind of follow their desires uh, for uh, what they want you know out of the Formula One team. If uh, they want us to go help the leather and spend all the money, uh, try and finish as high at the championship as we can, then that's what we should do. Uh, but uh, it better go well because that, there won't be anything to spend on following this. So, uh, I want to illustrate what a utility function might look like by introducing a bit of a game. Uh, let's say you're at a fairground and you see this sign uh, and it's inviting you to bet on a coin toss in order to win uh, a certain sum of money. Uh, so for those who don't know how coin tosses work, 50% uh, chance of getting the right answer. Uh, and in this game, if you uh, lose the coin toss, then you're going to lose your initial wager. And let's say, for the sake of argument, this is, this is your last sum of money. So uh, if, you, if you don't play this game, you can go out and, and choose to do something else with that money. If you play it and lose, then that's the end. You're going home. So what I want to do now is uh, ask everybody how much they would pay to play this game. Uh, clearly, uh, at one end, you know, paying one p to pay this play this game is extraordinarily extraordinarily good value. Uh, Nine pounds ninety nine, not quite so much. So, show of hands, who'd pay more than a pound to play this game? Very good. More than two? Just keep your hands up. 
<laughs> more than three? More than four? Uh, not many left. Five or more? Three gone. Oh, we've got one left. <laughs> There's always one. Five. Five? Well, you've done the maths. So, uh, the expected value of this game, so that is the amount you'd expect to win if you played this game a large number of times, is five pounds. Uh, I'm very glad to see that most of you wouldn't pay that much to play the game, and that means you, like most other human beings, uh, are loss of us. And that is you uh, value, uh, well, the value you place on a certain sum of money, uh, losing a certain sum of money, is greater than the value you put on gaining that same sum. Uh, and uh, this makes pretty good evolutionary sense when it's been explained to me. It's been explained as, uh, on the one hand, you could get the result you want and you could be exceedingly happy. Uh, the worst thing that could happen is you could be dead. And there's nothing as good as being dead is bad. So uh, it's, it's pretty natural that we should all feel this way. Uh, this loss aversion forms part of what's known as the law of diminishing marginal utility for money. Uh, and what we're saying there is that the value that human beings put on the first, uh, first pound that they earn is uh, the greatest, and for every subsequent pound it's slightly less. Uh, and we can represent this on uh, a graph like this. Uh, and in doing so we've invented a new unit. Uh, which is where the utility and utility function comes from. And what this unit represents is the, uh, the absolute value of a particular experience, be it sums of money or whatever else, to the agent we're dealing with. Uh, and once we know the shape of this graph for the agent we're dealing with, be it ourselves or somebody else, we can use it to convert any experience that they might have into a, into a score for utility, uh, provided that that is something that they can express in, uh, in, in money or uh, in pounds. Uh, we can then convert that into a, into a utility score. And that's useful because now we've compressed uh, everything that they could experience into, into one single metric that we can use to, to make comparisons about how we should behave. Uh, you know, be this trip to the beach, new clothes, uh, new planetary gearbox, anything you can think of. Uh, and you, you can think a, a little bit about this when it comes to your team and the Formula Student Project. So you could ask yourself how much you'd, you'd trade the uh, experience of Formula Student for. Uh, and if you think about it, you know this project might be the difference between getting that job in the automotive industry that you've always wanted, or in motorsport, uh, and, and not doing so. And you, you might put a value of thousands of pounds on that over the, over the course of your lifetime. But what we've, and what we are able to do here is now translate that into a uh, sum of utility where uh, you can start to compare everything against each other. Which sounds nice and simple, except there's plenty of things that are going to trip us up. Uh, how many of you have heard of the marshmallow test before? Got a few. Fantastic. So. Uh, this is a game where you uh, ask a, a small child, usually, uh, to sit in a room uh, with a marshmallow, and you can tell them, and you tell them that at any point in time they can eat that marshmallow, or if they can wait for uh, a short period, say 10 minutes, 15 minutes, then they'll get to have two marshmallows, which is clearly better than one, but. As you may have guessed, not every child is able to wait that distance in time before uh, taking marshmallow. So it's the existence of a gap in time that makes this difficult. Uh, on the one hand, yes, two marshmallows is better than one, but given that you don't know precisely what's going to happen between now and the end of that 15 minutes, it might make sense for you just to take the one that's in front of you and be done with it. And being able to delay gratification clearly has some benefits. You know, you're all studying at university, not because uh, this is a, a fantastic uh, you know, opportunity to earn loads of money, but because 
when you're educated with a good good degree, plenty of experience, you can go into the job market and expect uh, to earn a good chunk more than uh, any of your colleagues that decided not to go university to university and go straight into working. Uh, but at the same time, you know, sometimes you need to give yourself a break. Uh, go out and uh, and have a drink, even when you've got coursework due in the next day. Uh, if nothing else, a bit of time pressure focuses the mind. Uh, so we need to include effects like this into uh, the way we we kind of deal with with the human beings that we're working with. You know, our, what's their ability to delay gratification in, in different situations? Is it something uh, where people are going to be really impatient and the, the value of a, uh, a result today is worth a hundred times more than the same result tomorrow? Uh, what I hope this demonstrates is that the utility function isn't just a, a completely simple idea. It's a bit vague, there's, it's full of uncertainty, but uh, and there are uh, different behaviours that human beings tend to model uh, that don't make this a nice linear sum of utilities like it might be. So the second area that we can talk about is resource. Uh, again, this is what our agent possesses in order to uh, achieve the task that they set themselves. So uh, we can start off with the obvious example of material resource. Uh, you know, this can be finance, uh, this can be things like machine tools, uh, stuff, you know, stuff that's physical or uh, stuff that you can trade with uh, that can sort of indirectly further the course. You know, for example, a nice teaching space with some projection equipment that you can trade with uh, the best engineers in Formula One uh, is of some value to you. Similarly, you're going to have a constraint in time, particularly on your project. The, you know, the clock is ticking, the competition is on a fixed date, everything needs to be ready for then. Uh, but you can, if you've got multiple people, then you can spread that time uh, among uh, multiple people who are, who are all sort of working towards the same course. And finally, we've got knowledge and skills. So. Any team that has a better understanding of the problem or has skills like being able to weld, being able to machine parts correctly, puts themselves uh, at a clear advantage relative to teams who, who don't have that. And you know those teams are going to have to go out into the market, spend some of their material resource uh, that a, let's say, uh, a more skilled or knowledgeable team won't have to do. So. Hopefully we, we understand a little bit more about the, the people we're going to be dealing with, but what's the point of all this? So with a good knowledge of uh, what a utility function might look like, and with good knowledge of, of what your resource really is, uh, you can understand what a good result of your task is going to be. And you can start to get rid of arbitrary targets that uh, don't reflect the, the uh, holistically the the situation that uh, you're trying to improve. So I can give you an example of uh, if, you're, if you're a company that is selling a product into the market uh, and you've targeted in one year a 50% market share, uh, say from a starting point of 30% or so, and you end that year with 49% uh, market share. So, you know, do we need to fire everybody and uh, you know, refuse to give them references uh, and completely give up and, uh, and try something else? Uh, you know, let's say you've ended that year with um, fantastic morale within your company. You've got uh, you know very good staff retention, uh, and let's maybe even your main competitor has pulled out of uh, the the market that you're in because they couldn't compete with you on your margin. You know, is it still a failure? Because by our initial target, it is. Uh, but hopefully with all the things we've just talked about, we can uh, set out a more holistic view of the world 
And actually, we value those things as much as we value the, the, uh, the overall market share. Uh, and we should give those weighting as some that we should give those some weighting as well when we are evaluating the, the whole thing. Uh, on the resource side, you're no longer limited to fixed deadlines. You know, you know what you have at your disposal. You know how much time uh, that you might have. Uh, you know, I'm sure that when the competition comes around, your team is going to be amazed at the milestones that fly by. Uh, while you're, you know, all hands to the deck, trying to get the car ready. Uh, again, you know, take it from me. You can still be stickering the car in scrutin in the scrutineering queue and get a good result in Formula Two. It's uh, uh, the milestones are there as good guides, good things to aim at. The world doesn't end if you miss it. But of course, your team leader is going to dispute. <laughs> Move on. So I know that C comes next in the acronym. But uh, I'm going to go straight to E, and hopefully it will be clear like, why later. Uh, so we've started off, we've got our hopes and our dreams, and we've got what we're going to use to achieve it. But that's not going to be enough. Uh, the setting we're in, or the environment, is going to constrain what we can do. Uh, you're building a Formula student car in Surrey, in the southeast of England, that exposes you to all the local industry. Uh, that's, that's nearby. Uh, clearly doing the same in a less developed country is going to be a lot more difficult, but uh, at the same time your cost of living probably isn't great, so swings and roundabouts. So there are a few factors that uh, we're going to find are pretty common to any environment we choose to be in. Uh, we'll find that all the environments are made up of systems, uh, and all those systems include some degree of complexity, and that can lead to chaotic effects. Uh, and you're probably going to come across other agents as well, and there are some very strange things that can happen when uh, agents start interacting together in an environment. Uh, so just to clarify what we mean by a system, uh, we take the example of a car. Uh, uh, a system is defined as a process that includes multiple elements uh, behaving according to its own rules. Uh, you know, we've got a car on the screen here, which you could describe as a mechanical system, but uh, you know, we could all equally talk about biological systems, political systems, uh, uh, IT systems, you know, there's, there's plenty out there. But for all systems, we're going to have a series of, series of inputs uh, and a series of outputs. So with our car example, there are lots of different inputs we can make. We can turn the steering wheel, we can press the throttle pedal, uh, we can change gears, we can brake, we can turn the dials on the radio, we can uh, uh, turn on the indicators, that sort of thing. Uh, and as a result of that, we're going to uh, get some outputs. There'll be the motion of the car, there'll be the noise coming out of the speakers, there'll be signals to other road users, uh, and the car itself is going to introduce some traffic into the road network. Uh, if we were to talk about a political system, uh, you know, we're all part of a political system, we're all able to vote, we're all able to do things like write letters to our MP, we can see these as inputs as well, uh, and uh, as a result of all of that, you know, we get the state of the country we're in today. So, uh, inputs and outputs. Again, this is quite simple, but uh, all the systems that we're uh, going to be dealing with are likely to have some degree of complexity associated with them. Uh, this is a, a relatively new uh, area of study in mathematics, and we can describe a complex system as one that contains many interacting elements uh, that gives rise to emergent properties that form a hierarchy uh, higher up the yeah. So my, my favourite example of this is uh, a form, uh, racing tyre. So if you go to the smallest length scales in, in a racing tyre, you've got the individual atoms that make up the, the tread rubber compound. Uh, a length scale above that, you've got uh, long chains of molecules uh, that are all interacting uh, at, at that scale, uh, forming sort of the chemical behaviour of the rubber. Again, uh, a step abstracted from this, you've got the sort of the mechanical properties of the rubber itself and 
uh, things like the, the rubber master curve. Uh, another step above, you've got the interaction with the other elements of the tyre. You've got you know, interaction with the belt, uh, the, uh, the air that fills the tyre, uh, and how those, two, those things work together. And at your very highest level of abstraction, you've got the, the human's perception to the grip that that tyre has at any point in time. So what we've done here is at, at the sort of smallest scales, we've gone from the laws of physics uh, up to the laws of chemistry, uh, then engineering, and then finally sort of the human perception of, uh, of the grip of the tyre. So hopefully you'll agree, pretty complex. Uh, and this diagram shows the economy as a complex system where at the bottom level you've got employees that sort of emerge into teams and companies, uh, markets and the economy and uh, sort of information can pass up all the way through these layers uh, and you get, you get interactions sort of up and down as well as uh, within each layer itself. Uh, so I think the, what's important to remember here is to understand the level that you're dealing with and the level that's important to you. you know, clearly a uh, race, racing car driver doesn't care about the chemical compounds in the tyre itself. They care about how much grip that the tyre is providing to them. Uh, however, a, uh, a chemist charged with uh, creating the perfect tyre compound clearly cares about this a great deal. Something we're likely to see in systems like this is a phenomenon called chaos. And this is, again, it's a term we'll use very deliberately uh, to describe a particular mathematical behaviour. Uh, anybody who's come across the butterfly effect, where a butterfly that flaps its wings in Africa uh, gives rise to a hurricane that destroys the eastern seaboard of the United States, uh, this is the effect we're talking about. Uh, this is where small actions at the very bottom of a system hierarchy can explode up through the levels and appear at the, at the very top levels. If we... Uh, so what, a feature is an extreme sensitivity to the initial conditions that you find yourselves in. Uh, the scientists that model weather systems will run hundreds of thousands of simulations with very small differences in the initial conditions uh, to see how different features might propagate into the future. And what you end up with is, is like a probability distribution where at the very extreme end nothing, uh, very extreme end, nothing really changes or uh, you know, complete chaos, um, hurricanes, something like that. There's, there's probabilities for each of those along the spectrum, and the job of the weather forecaster is to decide which of those is much likely, given the uncertainty in the measurements they've taken that define the initial conditions. Uh, and, and if you look for these effects, you'll find them everywhere. Uh, you know, earlier this year, uh, the, the Russian military invaded Ukraine, and that's largely thought to be down to the decision of one man, but at the same time, uh, you know, a few years, uh, sorry, a few months uh, down the line, the energy bills and the manufacturing costs of your car have now all gone through the roof uh, because of, you know, something completely beyond your control uh, and something that was basically impossible to predict uh, a year beforehand. The COVID pandemic uh, is another good example of this. You know, one one virus that's um, come out of a, uh, an area of China, spread to the entire world, and um, we spent you know, months in lockdown because of it. So uh, finally on our environment, uh, it's, it's not likely that we're gonna be inhabiting this alone. And uh, what we'll find is, you know, there are very strange behaviors that, that come about because human beings start interacting and competing with each other. Uh, you know, hopefully uh, most of the people you'll come across uh, are going to cooperate. You know, you'll have lecturers, you'll have uh, friends, family, uh, they will want the very best for you. But uh, some other agents are going to uh, see your loss as their gain. Uh, and this uh, is where we start to look into the very interesting field of game theory. The most famous example of this is what's called the prisoner's dilemma. <coughs> So in this situation, two prisoners are caught on suspicion of uh, working together to perform a crime. Uh, 
and the police need to gather a confession uh, in order to press for sort of serious charges. Uh, and to do this, they, they offer them a deal. They say, if one of you confesses, we'll go easy on you, uh, we'll uh, blame you all on the other guy. So uh, the deal looks a bit like this. If both prisoners keep quiet, then they'll get away with a lesser charge, two years in prison each. Uh, if one of them confesses uh, and the other one keeps quiet, uh, the one that kept quiet is going to get 10 years, uh, while the one that confesses is only going to get one. Uh, and if both prisoners confess, it's seven years each. So clearly, this is where you want to be. A combined total of four years in prison is surely the best for everybody. Uh, next best, if only one confesses, that's 11 years. Uh, if both confess, it's 14 years in total, So, which is pretty rough. But if we look at the decision that each prisoner is facing, and assume that they're going to work to further their own interests, we can see that the best thing that a single prisoner can do is confess. Uh, because they get let out in one year if the other prisoner keeps quiet, and uh, it'll only be seven years rather than ten if the other prisoner confesses as well. So, to summarise the ridiculousness of this situation, we've gone from a position where uh, both, we've gone to a position where both prisoners are now going to condemn themselves to the uh, maximum total time in prison because each is trying to uh, further their own interests. Uh, and again, this is something you'll see everywhere. And I think uh, advertising is quite a good example. Uh, if you, as a company, decide you're going to spend uh, a load of money on marketing your product, then other companies in that space are going to be encouraged to do the same. Uh, so you'll end up with the same sort of market share of, uh, of advertising, but uh, now you're spending a lot more money in order to achieve it. Uh, a good example of this, when they banned cigarette advertising, the profits of the cigarette companies all skyrocketed, because now nobody had to worry about competing on advertising. So uh, that's our environment. It's uh, complex, it's chaotic, and it's full of other agents that are going to make everything worse. So, uh, sounds like it. Uh, so, we're coming back to C now, uh, which is our, our control, and this is largely linking the, the two together. Uh, we have what we want and where we're going to have to achieve it, now all we have to do is go out and do it. And this is what we'll call the control process. So this diagram illustrates the standard problem of control. Our target's going to arrive uh, in on the left-hand side, and we're going to compare it to an estimate of the state of our environment excuse me, that uh, we've uh, got from some kind of measurement. The, the comparison between the two, the target and the, and the state estimate, uh, are going to give us the error. So how far we are from where we want to be. Uh, let's say you want to drive to the supermarket, but at the moment you're sat in your car on the drive. That gives you your, your error state. That passes into a control law, which lays out how uh, you think you're going to have to behave uh, to get from where you are now to where you want to go. Uh, and those things turn into inputs that we can make into the environment, uh, and then we can then wait a, uh, wait a little bit uh, to get to the outputs, uh, do some more measurements, reevaluate the uh, the state error and then revise what we're going to do in the future. And this, and this goes on until you uh, reach what you want to achieve. Let's talk for a second about measurements, because they can lead us astray in a number of ways. Uh, I think the first thing to appreciate about measurements is they're not reality. The uh, oil temperature sensor on your car doesn't tell you precisely what uh, the average oil temperature uh, throughout the engine is. Uh, it's just an estimate based on reasonable means. Uh, the measurements we have uh, can be uh, irrelevant. So uh, I think one of my favorite examples of this is if you're doing a, a seven post rig uh, test where you're exercising the vertical dynamics of a car, the, uh, that's not particularly relevant to the case where the car is uh, driving along the road, the tyres are rotating, they have different properties. Uh, the measurements we come across can also be imprecise. Uh, think about car speedometers that have increments every 10 miles an hour. Your 
can be pretty nervous if you go through a speed camera that's got a, uh, a speed limit that's uh, got, got a five at the end, for example. Uh, they're going to suffer from errors, be they random or systematic. And sometimes, just the act of taking the measurement is going to affect the system in some way uh, that it doesn't give you a, an accurate reflection of, of how it was before. Uh, and while we can talk about scientific measurements, you could reduce this to completely non-scientific terms. You could talk about asking somebody how they're feeling. Uh, on the one hand, you could get an irrelevant answer. You could get a change of the subject. Uh, you could get something that's imprecise, just too vague, not, you know, not specific enough. Uh, or maybe the very act of asking somebody how they're feeling causes them to feel slightly different to how they were before. So hopefully that kind of shows some of the errors that we're going to get with our measurements. And they shouldn't be regarded as gospel. And with our targets and our measurements, this is going to define how we're going to behave. And we can talk about two types of actions in here. Uh, first of all, discrete flowchart type actions. Uh, this is uh, how we describe to the driver that they should do a qualifying lap or uh, a lap in the sprint when it, when it comes along. This, this is hopefully very familiar. It's all uh, based on flowchart critical path analysis type steps. Uh, and these steps, we, you know, built within each individual step, we'll see a, a more complex set of smaller steps, for example. So driving a racing car is not as simple as passing from uh, one box to another. But given how much practice the drivers had, uh, they're probably happy talking about it on these terms. We don't need to tell them that uh, when they feel the steering go heavy, they need to counter steer or something like that. And this, this is pretty similar to our complex system uh, description from earlier. You know, our control actions can be complex too. We just need to make sure we're describing the right level on the hierarchy in order to get the uh, in order to get the message across. The other type of action that we could choose to take or that we might need to take is uh, a, a regulator type action. Uh, what we've got here, you, some of you may recognise as a PID controller. Uh, the idea is that you have a target state that you want to maintain uh, and you can use a control action like this in order to do it. And we're talking more in continuous terms here. So let's say we're trying to prepare the tyres for a lap in qualifying or a lap in the screen. We could choose to take a, a proportional controller type action, in which case we'd try and warm the tyres according to the error between our, our current target temperature and the temperature we see ourselves at at the moment. Uh, an integral action will, uh, will cause us to try and warm the tyres more vigorously the longer we've stay, spent away from our target. Uh, and the derivative action will help us to spot change, uh, rates of change away from the, the target state and perform corrective action according to, according to that level. Uh, and and these, all these things together give us very tight control uh, and we can apply them to things we want to keep at a constant level. Say, we can talk about climate control systems, but equally we can talk about more abstract things like customer satisfaction, that sort of thing. We can describe them all as regulated problems. The, there is one more action that we could choose to take, and that is we could choose to perform an experiment. The idea here is that we're not trying to move towards our target necessarily, but we're trying to gain information that might uh, tell us more about the environment that we're in so that we can make better decisions about how to behave in the future. So let's say you're going out tyre testing. When you go out tyre testing, you're not r really advancing your score in the competition itself, but what you're doing is you're learning about the, the different options that you've got in front of you so that you can select the right one for when the competition arrives, your car's got the best grip to go out and set fantastic times in the sprint and the endurance. So again, that's quite a formal experiment, but we needn't treat things so formally. Uh, let's say you're, um, you, you want to plan a, a something at the weekend, 
going asking your friends whether they've got any plans that weekend, you could also see as an experiment. You're trying to gather information that you need in order to make a decision how you're going to uh, how you're going to act in the future. And this is where uh, we come into our, our learning and optimize, optimization loops that we talked about earlier in the diagram. The objective of doing these experiments is, is to learn, to increase our knowledge uh, resource that we, we as an agent possess. So every piece of information that we gather as part of our experiment or, or otherwise is going to nudge our beliefs one way or another. So uh, let's take your tire testing example again. You're going to go in with a reasonable idea of what you uh, expect from the tire test, because you've all seen the um, CalSpan tire data for, for the car, for the tires that you're going to test. And you're going to plan a test that you hope will give you the information you need to finally make that decision. As the results start to come in, they're going to nudge your beliefs one way or the other. You're going to, they're either going to reinforce them, you know, you, you go in, uh, you get the result that you thought you were going to get, or maybe they're going to contradict them and they're going to push your beliefs in, in, a, in a different direction. Uh, powerful results are going to move your beliefs uh, further than uh, weak results from, from dodgy experiments. Uh, and in mathematics, this, this process is called Bayesian updating. Uh, and while the maths is very complicated, the idea is very simple. So uh, this is something that we can kind of use to model the learning that we do when we're performing experiments uh, like the ones we've talked about. Uh, but at the same time, we can, uh, we can get unstuck in this. It's completely possible to bias your experiment towards giving you the results that you uh, have before you've started gathering any data. Uh, this is a very dangerous road to go down. Uh, it's how things like internet echo chambers work, and hopefully that's a good enough example to, for you to sort of appreciate uh, this isn't how you want to behave. Uh, and how are we going to use this newfound knowledge that we've got? So we're going to use it to modify how we're going to behave. When we've got the results from the tire testing, Presumably, we're going to select a tyre that we're going to use for the entirety of the event. Uh, similarly, you know, when, when you know what uh, plans your friends have at the weekend, that's going to tell you, you know, whether you should go and uh, arrange that night out. Uh, something along those lines. Uh, and this has a bit of an analogue with mathematical processes of optimization. Uh, and I think the best example of this is what's known as the method of steepest descent. Uh, it's an expansion on, on sort of Newton, Raphs, and methods that you might have come across in, in school or, or part of your university course. Uh, once you understand the most important aspects that affect your results the most, you can weight those appropriately towards getting the best outcome. And the hope is if you, if you follow those down, you arrive at uh, the, the global minimum for your problem, and that's the best you're ever going to do. Uh, but, as you can see, this, any landscape is likely to be littered with uh, an array of local minima that look like the best option, but uh, are actually some far away from what optimal would look like. And there are methods to help with this situation as well. Wherever you are, the global optimum, the best you could possibly do, is probably some distance away from where you are at any point in time. And in order to get there, you're going to need to make a big jump and uh, do something different to what you're currently doing. Uh, an example that's, that's maybe common to Formula student teams is uh, optimizing your chassis design. So uh, I, think you, I think you're right in, I think I'm right in saying your team, you currently use a steel space frame chassis. Yeah. Uh, and Presumably this has been running for some years and you've gone through a process of, of optimization, choosing different tube sizes, uh, arriving at something optimal where everything fits, it's got good structural properties uh, and you know, very light. I'm afraid you're not going to have the fastest car. The, the teams that will beat you uh, all have carbon chassis. 
So we've, as a team, you might find it necessary one day to break out of this optimization loop for your steel space frame chassis and make the transition over to carbon. Uh, and it's something that uh, a lot of teams have already done. Some teams uh, are, are planning to do and maybe have been planning to do it for many years. Uh, some teams, content with their steel space frame, uh, it's, a, it's a very good learning exercise designing a chassis like that. Uh, wouldn't want to push anybody away from it who didn't want to. So in maths, there's a category of problems called bandit problems that hopefully can guide you uh, to when to stick with what you have or when to make the transition to uh, reach out, explore into the unknown. And the analogy that's used is playing lots of slot machines in a casino. So the problem is you walk into, your, into the casino, there's lots of different slot machines, they've all got different odds, you need to decide which one you're going to sit at uh, for and spend the money that you've got to spend. This uh, led mathematicians to develop something called the Gittins Index, and uh, it tells us, I think, two main things about explore exploit problems. Uh, the, this method itself is, is quite specific to a uh, particular case, but it should, it should generalize across many similar problems. Uh, the first thing it teaches us is even if you're having, uh, well, first thing it teaches us is you should be exploring a lot more than you think. Even if you're having a lot of success with the way you're currently working, going out exploring, trying different things is going to bring you a lot more success in the long run. There's always likely to be better approaches out there, uh, and the good thing is it's usually pretty quick to discount ways that aren't going to work, so you needn't spend much time considering those. The second lesson is that the more you value success in the long term, many years uh, down the line, the more you should be investing in exploring today. Uh, and this is, this is pretty simple. The more time you spend exploring earlier on, the more time you've got to exploit the best solution when you found it. Obviously this is hard when you've all got short term goals, you've got to deliver a car every year, but Every opportunity you take to explore will hopefully make future decisions that much easier and uh, open up new possibilities that you, you can't reach at the moment by working in, in the way that you're doing. Let's go back to our very simple model. Uh, hopefully what, uh, what we've demonstrated is that contained within these sort of very simple uh, ideas are uh, topics from science and maths that cover things like behavioral economics, control theory, complexity, chaos, game theory, uh, explore, exploit problems, uh, Bayesian updating, you know, massive topics in, in, in science and mathematics. And uh, they can be telling us how we, we can be behaving to get to where we want to be. On this diagram, you should be able to draw two distinct loops. The first uh, is what I describe as our normal behavior, uh, uh, our sort of handle cranking loop. This is our, our typical response to a uh, input from the environment. So, you know, if we have an itch, we scratch it. If we run out of food, we go and buy some more. There's nothing much clever in here. The second loop is what uh, we'll call process optimization. And this is the process of improving how we can behave using experimentation, uh, learning and optimization. If we want to improve how we do things in a way that gets us better results, we're going to have to spend a lot of time in this loop. Uh, we, and things like tyre testing, developing carbon chassis all fall in here. But absolutely too much time spent in this loop, you run out of time to do uh, all the other elements that you need to get done in order to achieve your outcome. And what I thought I'd do is try and finish with a familiar example, uh, hopefully one that's all, all uh, close to all of your hearts, the task of putting together a former student car. So, 
starting off with the agent. What do we know about the agent? I assume it's uh, the department that runs your team. So they provide the cash. It's, it's their, their, uh, their train set. They're in charge. They've probably got an expectation over the, the quality of the car that you're going to produce. You know, they, they're going to want to show this off to prospective students. Uh, you know, they, they want it to be an impressive thing uh, that, that chooses people to come to your university and not go somewhere else. There's going to be some expectation on finishing position, maybe. Uh, so they want to look good compared to other universities. Uh, they clearly care about how much money you spend. And, but they also want, I think, the team members to benefit from this experience. They want you to go out and have successful careers, promote your university to, uh, throughout the industry. So these are the elements that are going to contribute to a successful outcome in their eyes. Uh, and in terms of the resource, presumably you have a grant from the department plus any, anything you can raise from sponsorship. I'm assuming there will be uh, some ability to use machine tools within, within the labs. Uh, and at the same time, so it, within each of you lies the skills and knowledge that are going to dictate the, uh, the progress of the car build throughout, uh, uh, throughout the next few months into the competition. The environment that you find yourselves in is, is the local indus industry to your team. Uh, you're going to be constrained by engineering systems uh, designing the car. You know, everything's got finite stiffness, there's no unobtainium. Uh, you're going to be limited to the, the physical materials that you have around you. Uh, maybe there's going to be some simulations, uh, and these simulations are going to uh, transcend the complex hierarchy of the, the complex system that is the racing car. Uh, this could be finite element type simulations at, at your fine level, up to subsystem level, maybe powertrain simulations, and then even at the level of, of the whole car where you're doing vehicle dynamics handling type simulation. The whole team is going to be vulnerable to chaotic effects from the economy. Uh, and the weather, so whether on testing days, whether on the, on the competition itself. I've got experience of this where we went out in the first group of cars that was supposed to be the fastest. Uh, when all the rain came down, we finished a good, good long way down the, uh, um, good way, long way down the standings. But uh, that's what chaotic systems can do. Uh, and of course, you've got your competing agents from other universities, uh, and maybe. Even, Maybe even there's internal competition amongst the uh, amongst the team here. It's uh, it's definitely not, nothing to be promoted. But at, at the end of this process, there's going to be a, a, a few good jobs that uh, everybody might end up applying for. But believe me, the best candidates for those jobs are going to be the ones that have demonstrated that they can help each other uh, in maximising the um, the performance of the team that they're working with. On day one of this program, you probably came up with a plan, uh, which you can call your control process. And each week, maybe you review your position on this plan and uh, where you are in the process relative to where you expect to be, uh, to ensure that you finish in time for the competition itself. Part of your work is going to be performing experiments, maybe improving parts of the process that didn't work so well last year and also exploring new opportunities. Maybe you can get a, a, a new chassis manufacturing technique. Maybe there's a, an ECU on the market that you think is going to improve your performance. And this is going to keep going until the day of the competition itself. And uh, a good final position with a lot of learning, limited stress, is clearly a positive outcome. You know, part of broken bits, arguments running throughout the team, something to be avoided. But hopefully, if you can appreciate some of the lessons uh, that, that some of these ideas that we talked about can teach, uh, it's definitely going to be the first one. What I've presented today is a pretty brief overview of, of what's in the book, and it's, there's been a few specific examples tailored to your team. Uh, for anybody that doesn't have it yet, uh, I am very much hope that it will give greater insight into how some of the ideas in science and maths uh, can contribute in your in the work that you're doing in your careers. 
uh, as I say, my aim was to write the book that I wish I'd read at the start of my career. Hopefully it's not, uh, you don't see this as a business pitch for me. My hope is that you can go out and use these ideas to solve the world's problems. Uh, and to reflect that, all the proceeds from this book are going to the Small Peace Trust so they can continue their fantastic work inspiring the, the next generation of young engineers. Uh, otherwise, uh, please feel free to connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is thank you all very much for your time. Uh, all the best in the competition.